Thank you, United for Action, for putting this on and putting this all together. It's amazing. Um, so, yeah. so um, my name is David Alisea. I'm an organizer for the Sierra Clubs Beyond Coal campaign. And I'm here to talk about our offshore energy future, sort of the Sierra Club's vision and what I hope a uh, vision that many of you guys share as well. So one of the reasons that we're, the Sierra Club's really kind of focused on renewables here in New York is because of climate change. We just saw it um, over a year ago, Superstorm Sandy. It devastated entire communities um, across not just only in New York City, this is a photo from the Rockaways, but on Long Island and New Jersey, we're seeing the impacts of climate change right now. And we clearly need to do something about it. We can talk about resiliency and hardening, but we need to make sure that we're reducing our greenhouse gases if we want to avoid these storms in the future. And so, as many of you guys know, energy is a big source of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, New York State has a 30% target for renewables by 2015. Unfortunately, we're behind on that. So statewide, we're at 22%. But if you look at the power we produce here in New York City, we're under 1% renewable, actually. Uh, most of our, our power plants are natural gas. So they're, using, they're using frack gas, pretty much. And it's polluting our air and causing some serious problems. And so you look at what can you do to uh, make our, our system better, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. There's energy efficiency, there's geothermal, there's wind, there's solar. And Sierra Club believes in an all the above option when you're talking about these kind of things. Um, so, you know, and we were taking a look and we've done some great jobs on efficiency. New York State has a, a Green Jobs Green New York program, which is actually really on the cutting edge of things. Other states have been looking at this program because it's, it's so innovative and it's working so well. Uh, we actually also have New York Sun. The governor has made a commitment to solar energy. Um, and so in 2012, we saw solar, installed solar double. In 2014, we saw it quadruple. We're making huge gains. And even just two weeks ago, the governor came out and agreed on the funding for 3,000 megawatts of new solar by 2020. Um, so he's, he's committed to it, and we're doing some really cool things on it. But one of the things that we haven't done much on lately is wind. States like Iowa and South Dakota get more than 20% of their energy from wind. And so if we can add that to our 22% that we have now, we're almost at 50% renewables. And we can do that within five, 10 years. And so the question becomes, are we going to continue investing in fossil fuels or invest in new clean tech generation? And this LNG facility is the perfect example of that sort of dichotomy. It's sort of a, it puts it right in, in perspective of what we're deciding between. And so the, the solution's pretty clear. We should be investing in, in wind. It's, the, it's clearly the better solution in, in many different ways. And I'm going to sort of lay it out in a couple of different reasons why. Um, one of the, the reasons is because we have a lot of uh, production ability right here in New York. So the examples I used before, Texas, Iowa, North Dakota, they're sort of different. You know, they're plain states. People think of them as great kind of wind energy places. But people forget, you go out there to the ocean, the wind's always blowing. And so we have the potential to really become a leader in this, this field. And the second generation of wind has really caught up. So if you think of some of the older wind farms, um, you know, the, they're small, they don't produce that much power. The new ones are, are further out, they're less expensive and larger, and they can produce more power. They can compete with a real fossil fuel plant. And the cool thing about it here in New York is that we have projects waiting. And so, you know, we have one off the coast in Montauk that is ready to go near the end of the year. And we have the one uh, right here in the same place as the LNG facility. And so that project is the New York City Long Island Collaborative. Um, and it's a joint venture between Con Ed, uh, the Long Island Power Authority, and the New York Power Authority. Um, to give you an idea of where it's at, you're, it's about 15 miles off of Long Beach, Long Island, and 20 miles off the Rockaways. And this site could produce power for 90 to 200,000 homes. Or if you're thinking of just New York City, that's, it could provide 5% of New York City's energy usage, 5 to 10%. And so um, one of the things that I think Sean already mentioned is that these two sites cannot coexist. 
Um, so if you look at this image, you know, the LNG facility is right sort of in the way of the wind farm. And it's not just like, oh, we can move a couple of turbines away. You need room for the ships. Again, the, the problems that, that Sean really mentioned, it, it would not make it practical or economical to put a wind farm if there was an LNG facility there. So to give you some more background on uh, the wind farm, the power would be purchased by LIPA and Con Ed. They sort of agreed to buy it. Who knows exactly how they'll split it up. Long Island will get some, New York City will get some. Those details will be worked out later. Uh, the project was first proposed in 2009, and construction could begin in 20, 2017. Um, so the process is a little bit longer than the LNG facility. No surprise there. Um, they always make it easier for the fossil fuel industry to get their, what they want. Um, but they've done a lot of work already to move this project forward. So they did a lot of stakeholder input. They talked to fishermen. They talked to birders to modify the proposal already because of the same reasons I think that Sean was saying with the LNG port, they don't care about the, the fishermen. They don't care about the people that are using the water. The people behind the wind development, the New York Power Authority, they want to get this project with a broad base of support. They don't want any opposition out there, and they've really done a good job going out there and soliciting feedback to make sure that we're building this and we're building it smart. And the total project is two to 400 turbines. The amount will be decided later on when they put it out to bid and that whole process goes forward, but it's a substantial, substantial wind farm. One of the big questions that we get is, what is this wind farm going to actually look like? And so if you think of, many of you probably have heard of uh, the Cape Wind Project over in Massachusetts. A lot of people complain, oh, oh it's going to look bad. And that project is, you know, two miles out, you're going to see a windmill. So if you think windmills are ugly, you're not going to like it. But even if you think windmills are ugly, this project isn't going to have any of those problems. You're talking 15 to 20 miles out. And I can't really see much there. It's just a dot on the kind of horizon. And one of the things I really find interesting about wind personally, and I think is a compelling case when you're talking to a kind of broad audience, when you're talking to elected officials and politicians and business people, is the fact that we can make New York a clean tech leader. So the European offshore wind industry already employs over 35,000 people. And we can become home to one of the first offshore wind projects in the US. Um, you know, one person might beat us to it, but we'll be second, and we can really ramp up after this. And we're kind of uniquely positioned. We have a, a great, amazing tech sector here. We have one of the largest ports in the, in the world. And we have a manufacturing base. And so we have all the tools ready so that we can not just build our own wind turbines and produce our own energy here, but we can also be, you know, when there's a project in Maryland or Virginia or somewhere else, we can create jobs right here to, to support those projects. Another big question that people ask is, well, you know, is this wind farm going to cost me? We already pay a lot in, you, you know, electricity prices here. It's expensive. And so people are really sensitive to that. And one of the really neat things about wind is that it's produced when you need the power. On those hot summer days, the wind's really blowing out there in the ocean. So the future costs are lower and they're more predictable. Unlike natural gas, the prices don't change all the time. And so this is the price of natural gas over the past, you know, 20 years or so. Yeah, we have gotten a little bit cheaper now because of fracking and all the abundance of gas, but the price is going to go back up. We know that. That's what always happens. The frack gas is only going to be around for a short time. And then hopefully if you guys do your job, we won't be using it at all. So the prices will definitely go up. Um, and again, I think those costs are going to be invested here in New York. And so the numbers that they, they talk about is you spend a dollar. For every million dollars you spend on on renewables, you get 16 jobs, where with fossil fuels, it's not like that anymore. This, you know, the LNG facility is going to produce 10 jobs or so. It, the numbers are, are hugely different. And so what would you choose? You have a rotary phone. It's reliable. People you know, know it. You, can, you know it'll work, and it's pretty inexpensive. Or you can buy a new iPhone. Most folks are going to buy the new iPhone. Yeah, it's a little more expensive up front, but over the long term, you're going to be able to do a lot more things. It's a lot cooler. That's the, what we have with wind right now. We can stick with what we know and what works, or we can choose the new high-tech option. 
Another big thing that people bring up, and I think probably a lot of people in this audience, you know, have questions about are the environmental impacts. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that it has absolutely no impact. Everything we do has some impact, unfortunately. We just have to be smart about it and figure out ways to reduce it. We do have the example, we've been able to see what they've done in Europe with their offshore wind industry, and there's been minimal impact to, minimal impact to wildlife. Wind platforms in the long term have actually help serve as artificial reefs and help the marine ecosystem. And because these projects are larger, they're slower, birds have the chance to go around them, whales can see them, they kind of know they're there and they know to avoid it. And the fact is that climate change is real. That climate change is more dangerous to our ecosystem than offshore wind will be. If you're talking about in terms of ocean acidification, you know, super storms, changing migratory patterns, we're going to have some serious issues if we don't invest in renewables and invest in wind. And so I know there's been a lot of talk about these bird impacts. Um, and it is definitely something that we should watch, we should be, watch out for and be considering. Um, but here's one example of sort of the magnitude of difference. You know, for fossil fuels, you're killing five birds per gigawatt, which is a, for wind energy, you're like 0.269. So that's you know, 20 times as many birds are killed by fossil fuels than by, by wind energy. Should we be reducing it? Do we have to change siting? Yeah, you have to be careful with it. You have to do monitoring. There's a lot of cool stuff they're talking about doing that. But you know, wind energy is a pretty safe alternative. And so to get into some of the weeds of things, I'm going to go through Rhode Island first and how they have worked on wind. They're going to have a pilot project um, under construction this year and then a larger project probably by the end of the year. And so first, a developer identified interest in wind development. He picked out an area and said, this is what, where I'd like to build a wind farm. The state stepped in and led an ocean management process where they talked to people in the, you know, the fishermen and all the stakeholders and identified a renewable energy zone. Then the federal government was like, okay, you guys did your work, you did your research, here's the lease for the, the project, and now they're looking for the power purchase agreements for people to buy that power to begin construction. In New York, in this case, you had a utility identify the wind development. So Con Ed and LIPA and NIPA got together and identified this area. Unfortunately, the state hasn't done the follow-up work. They've just sort of sat on things and not gotten it done. As a result, the federal government, which gives the lease, isn't moving it forward. They, don't, they want to see the state take a lead. They have plenty of areas that are focusing on this. And they are going, well, we're going to focus on you know, Rhode Island, where they have all their stuff together, where they've done all the homework. But unlike Rhode Island, we have a power purchase agreement already guaranteed. So we know that Con Ed and LIPA are going to buy this power. So what's missing? Why is this process stuck? It is our lovely Governor Cuomo. He's the decider. And so what we have been asking him for is this, let's turn, not burn. And so Governor Cuomo has the opportunity to veto this LNG facility and move the wind project forward. And so this is the perfect opportunity for him to step up and say, we're not going to invest in dirty, outdated fossil fuels, and we're going to invest in new, clean, renewable energy. He can designate the area for wind development, and then that federal process will move forward. And interestingly enough, the state has done some of the, the, that work for the Ocean Action Plan. I mentioned before how they talk to stakeholders, they talk to fishermen. Those are different pieces. But somehow the report's just sitting in some dusty bin in Albany somewhere. And you know, there's no reason, they don't have any, there's no mechanism to force them to release that. So it's really just up to the governor to tell his agencies, put these reports out, start the comment process, and get it going. And one of the really useful tools about this juxtaposition between the LNG and the wind is that it gives Governor Cuomo some cover. So wind will bring jobs and economic opportunity to the region. Because you know, there are folks out there that'll say, if we say no to LNG, oh, what about the jobs? What about the money it's going to bring us? Governor Cuomo, if he makes the right decision, can say, you know what, we're going to bring more jobs and more innovation to the state by investing in wind. Then we, and this is a better option than any LNG facility. In addition, this wind facility would displace um, our need for fossil fuel facilities, lower natural gas demand, and help us turn away from the continued use of fossil fuels. 
So for example, the Atlantic chapter of the Sierra Club has taken some strong action on Ravenswood Natural Gas Plant um, and taking them to court on it. We could do more of that and make a more compelling reason to shut down these dirty, outdated plants if we can show there's some real clean renewable energy to dis displace this. And so the real big question is, how do you move a governor? And I've had this discussion with a lot of activists, a lot of supporters on issues. A governor's not an easy man to move. What we need to do is build strong grassroots support for wind. Much like I think the fracking movement has done, they've really stopped him from being able to invest, to, to let fracking happen, because he's just seen this opposition rise up. If he sees a, a, a group of people rise up in favor of wind, we're going to force him to do something. We're going to force him to react. We also need to build a strong coalition with new voices, and so that means actually reaching out to labor, reaching out to business. This is the kind of issue that we can build a good, diverse group of people to move us into this clean, renewable energy future. And we also need to tell, make it clear to the governor that his political legacy hinges on his energy legacy. And so when you talk about states like Rhode Island, New Jersey might be moving forward on wind, Maryland moving forward on wind. If the governor wants to run for president, or run for, for higher office, this is the example we need to set to him. You can't have you know, Chris Christie running against him and have Chris Christie be the better environmentalist. That doesn't make sense. And so how can you help? You can continue supporting um, some of the great organizations like United for Action that have been actively fighting this, this uh, fossil fuel infrastructure across the city. Um, they're doing an amazing job. And an amazing plug that I actually just found out about this morning, got the final details on, was you can join us for the New York Energy Plan hearings. This New York Energy Plan sets sort of the state's broad goals and visions for what we want to do with energy. The governor in this plan, it was like 200 pages, but he didn't mention fracking, and he frequently said, we need to ramp up on natural gas. For example, for Indian Point, what he wants to do is he wants to build a natural gas plant. So this is our opportunity to get out there to show force and make some noise and tell the governor we can't be investing in outdated fossil fuel. We need to invest in new clean generation. And again, he wants these hearings to go quiet. He wants it to, for no one to talk about it, for it to be a process where no one hears a thing. We have an opportunity to make some noise and to kind of put it right in his face and show we're watching you and we want action. So. On the 19th at Brooklyn College at 3 o'clock, they're having a hearing, and then at John Jay College in Manhattan on the, the next day at 10 a.m., um, they'll be having a hearing. Um, in the handouts you got, there's some contact, you, there's a place for you to write down your contact info, and we're just sort of building this process. We found out today about these hearings. So if you want to keep in touch, you want to know more, we're going to be really organizing around these events, um, and I'll be talking to groups like UFA and see how they can help and how we can have a really kind of strong uh, coalition out there telling the governor you know, give up on natural gas and start investing in wind. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>